Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. It seems like everybody's excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Why don't you stand with us as we begin to worship the Lord? Give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Go on and go worship the Lord.
thankful for the Lamb of God. Aren't you thankful for Jesus and what he has done for you and what he has accomplished for you tonight? Hallelujah. We're going to take our need before the Lord tonight. I know I've already had people coming up to me and telling me that they have prayer requests, so we're going to go ahead and let you make those requests known at this time. Anybody else have any requests that you want to make known? Yes. Well, we have many needs in the house tonight. Sometimes we come in here and, and I ask you two or three times and I have a couple of responses. But tonight, I didn't even really have to ask you more than once. And there's so many people that have a need tonight and we have lots of needs up on the screen so we know that we serve a God that is bigger than any of these needs and so we don't have to fear if he's going to work and if he's going to move or whatever his will is because we can walk with him in the times that we have um, struggles and uncertainties and things going on in our families that we don't know how those things are going to work out so I know tonight that there are so many people, I would say there's less people in this room that don't have a, a, a dire need tonight than who do. So I'm going to give you the opportunity tonight if you want to come up and have the ministry lay hands on you tonight and you want to have your needs prayed for specifically by the ministry, you can do that when we begin to pray. If not, you can help me remember, call out as many of these needs before the Lord as you can remember because there were so many and 
God, but I believe God already heard them, and so that's what really matters is that you had the faith to bring that need to the Lord tonight. Let's go ahead and take these needs to him right now. Lord, we worship you tonight, God. We thank you for being able to come together in your house and to be unified as a body, Lord, that you would intend us to be. God, we pray tonight for every single need that has been called out in this room before you, God. We pray that you would just move and work, Lord, in every life, God. We know that there are so many things that go on in lives, God, and that there's a lot of uncertainty about how situations will turn out, God. But we pray right now for every person who has a need in their body, God, whether it be cancer or whatever it is, God, we pray that you would just go to that person where they're at, God, and that you would just begin to work, God, that you would begin to calm the hearts of family members that are maybe going through some stressful times right now, God, in the name of Jesus, right now, Lord, we pray that you would give peace. In Jesus' name, God, I pray that you would just begin to work, God, and people who need to feel your love tonight, God. I pray that you would just fall in this room right now, God, that your presence would be known by every person that's here tonight, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you're going to have your way, God, tonight, that your will is going to be done, Lord. And I pray that somebody is going to hear an answer for their prayer tonight because of their faith. In Jesus' name, God, I pray that you would just work and move. Lord, hallelujah, God. Give rest where it's needed tonight, God. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, God. Go to Whitney, God, where she's at right now, Lord, and, and just give her peace and rest. God, touch Lady tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Touch Sister Pulliam, God. You see her body, you see the need that's in it, God, and I pray that you would just move on her right now, God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, touch every prodigal tonight, Lord. God, let your spirit flow out of this place tonight, Lord, that people begin to reach out for your presence, God, and what's true, God, and what's not. God, let them be able to tell the difference, God, and be hungry for it in the name of Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. You are worthy tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship you, Jesus. presence in this room right now. Hallelujah. He is in this room right now. And perhaps maybe there's just somebody that needs to do something. Maybe you just need to lift your, your hands up and you need to surrender that need to God. Maybe you just need to trust him a little bit more right now with it. Maybe there's some kind of fear that's trying to seep into your heart right now. God is going to take that fear from you.
it's just okay to take a little extra time and let God do what God needs to do. And that's what we're doing in this place right now. And that's okay. It's God's will for us to let him move and let him have his way in this place right now. The thing that you brought into this place tonight, the thing that is burdening your heart tonight, why don't you just give him a shout of praise in this place right now? Because he is worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, you in your class that whatever you came here to this place in need of tonight if you haven't already got it you're going to get it before you leave in Jesus name exactly 30 minutes and that's all I'll need because I get to come back next week <laughs> let's go to the word of the Lord tonight we're going to be talking in the next uh, few lessons about grace to overcome and you can just fill in the blank there's grace to overcome anything that you're facing in your life and I'm thankful that we're living in the age of grace 
the dispensation of grace. You know, the Bible says that Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. It was not um, it was not really time for grace as a dispensation and what would uh, mark it by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. But the Bible says that when God was going to destroy the earth and destroy every living thing, that one man, Noah, found grace in side of the Lord and because of that uh, the human race was spared because of him and his household going into the ark of safety and I'm thankful tonight for the power of God's grace but we're going to be talking about I want you to be thinking about what grace is your definition of grace we'll be coming back to that here in a moment uh, if you're talking about things that we need to overcome Let's start right here. Two of the biggest obstacles that we face in life are failure and the fear of it. Failure and the fear of failure. The fear of failure is, is probably just as big of a problem for us as failure itself. And I want you to know tonight that the grace of God gives us the power to overcome any failure or any fear that would keep us from acting um, upon the Word of God in our lives. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, why is failure in any area of life so hard for us to fight through? Why is failure so hard for us to fight through? Anybody? Sometimes when you ask a real obvious question, you think you just get real obvious answers, but instead everybody thinks maybe this is a trick question. No, nobody wants to fail. That's right. Nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants their reputation to be called into question, right? Yeah. Too many obstacles. Do what? Too many obstacles. Too many obstacles. Okay. Anybody else? Why is it so hard for us to fight through failure in any area of life? what? We never do anything with the intention of failing. Okay, you didn't do it with the intention of failing, and there's nothing, you know, like a feeling of failure to just completely deflate you, right? Yeah. To make you feel like, why did I expend all that energy, all that effort for this result? Um, the, the statement that comes to my mind is, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. That's how I feel sometimes when I put my effort into something and then I don't see result. Uh, but sometimes uh, we are predefining failure and sometimes not getting the result that we want is really not failure at all. Uh, there's some things that are out of our control. And when you look at the uh, roll call of the Hebrews of faith, uh, it listed all these who did mighty exploits and then it went on to say, and others were not delivered. It said others were tortured. Others um, didn't have the, the same miraculous outcomes as some of these others that we've been reading about and talking about in the Roll, Roll Call of Faith. But then he gets down to the end and he says, but these all received the good report of faith. Why? Because success and failure, sometimes we define it wrong, the truth is success is just being faithful to God in all circumstances. Uh, but it is hard for us to get back up and to try again. How do you get back, back up after falling down in your spiritual commitments? Let's just say it that way. Um, you know, Pastor Marty up here, if there's anybody that folks should look at and say, well, you know, he's probably got it together, then uh, in this church that would probably be me. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. But the truth is, I'm just a human being like everyone else. I have my own weaknesses and areas uh, that I have to battle through. And um, I experience failure just as much as anybody else. But whenever you fall down in your spiritual commitments, how do you get back up? What do you do? What do you do personally uh, to rebound from a spiritual failure. Very good. You have to recognize it 
and you have to be willing to start over. That's probably one of the biggest problems that we have um, in our walk with God. And if I can say this without, and none of this is in my notes, but if I can say this without sounding mean, uh, there are whole spiritual movements that exist to, and I use the word spiritual, I guess I shouldn't use the word spiritual, um, but even Christian movements. Some of these movements exist today as an effort to explain what they lost. Did you catch that? In other words, if the power of God doesn't move in our services, instead of recognizing that maybe there's something we need to work on, something we've lost that we need to regain, maybe one group would say, well, that just isn't available anymore. Since we're not experiencing, then it must just not be for us. And so what do you have? You have false doctrine that springs out of the fail to the failure to recognize failure. That's really the, the big failure, isn't it? The failure to recognize when you need to change, and when you need to move forward. And uh, if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing in our lives. We'll just, um, we'll just change the definitions. We see this in our government all the time. Uh, if you don't like an outcome, just change the definition, right? Um, we don't have <coughs> illegal aliens, right? We don't have an illegal alien problem in the United States. We have uh, undocumented. Migrants. You just call it something that's not quite so severe. Okay? And that's just one example I use because it's in the news every day. But very good, Sister Rebecca. The way we get back up is to recognize, you know what? This this isn't cutting it. And the answer is to go back and begin to rebuild in the areas of where I have fallen down in my commitments to God. Uh, you will find whatever you lost wherever you left it. There's a revelation for you. You'll find it where you left it. I have spent hours looking for a set of keys or a screwdriver. Or 100% of the time, I find it wherever I left it. The problem is recognizing where I went wrong. And that's the same thing um, for us. We'll find what we need and that we've lost our relationship with God at the same altar that we stopped going to. We'll find it where we left it. All right, I want to read to you some scriptures here. Mark chapter uh, 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 5 through 7. This is... Uh, after Jesus has been crucified, and now they're coming to the tomb um, on the third day to, I think, to anoint his body and to um, just continue to mourn. Uh, but when they got there, the Bible says that entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. I'm reading from the New King James Version here. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So what I want to ask you right now is, why do you think that the angel specifically called out Peter? He said, the Lord has risen. He's not here. But go tell his disciples and Peter. He could have just said, go tell his disciples because Peter was one of the disciples, right? right. But he said, go tell his disciples and Peter that he has gone before you into Galilee. Anybody want to take a stab at why you think that the angel specifically mentioned Peter? Okay, so God had a future plan for him, and why is that so significant that he would actually, he had a future plan for the others as well, 
but why do you think for Peter himself that he had to, the angel felt like he needed to put his name in there? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Um, is it because Peter denied the Lord? Okay, there you go. No, so, thinking, yeah, that's sure. what you were thinking. Okay. I was just being curious. Yeah, and now here's the truth of the matter. The Bible says that there came a point, and one, one gospel says it this way, whenever they took Jesus and they arrested him and they took him to scourge him and all this stuff, um, the Bible says at one point that they all forsook him and fled. Okay? Um but when you read the details, so the truth was they all failed the Lord, right? They all, did not, they didn't stick with him. Uh, they watched him afar off, and the Bible says they all forsook him and fled. But Peter, whenever Jesus told, told him, you're going to deny me, you're not going to be able to stand up against the pressure when this happens, and Jesus prophesied to him exactly what was going to happen. He said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, Lord, no, I would never... I will never deny you. I would never do that. I'm with you until the very end. No one's going to change my mind. I would give my very life for you, etc., etc., etc. So imagine the sense of failure that Peter had. Now, we, when we track the story, uh, we see that there were three occasions. Uh, he was warming himself by the fire, and someone said, Hey, I recognize you. You're one of those disciples of Jesus. And he said, Oh no, I don't. I don't know this man. And then again, um, he was talking, and someone heard him, and they recognized his accent. And they said, "You're a Galilean. You're one of those that uh, follows Jesus." And again, he denied. So uh, there's three occasions um, that are recorded. And the third time, when he refuted the charge and said, "I, I don't know him." Um, he actually became angry, and I guess to kind of go a step further to try to prove that he wasn't with Jesus, he cussed. He said, I don't know him, and he threw in an expletive or two. And uh, he wanted to make sure they, they believed that he wasn't, because he was, he was afraid. He was afraid for his life, and they'd taken Jesus, and, and now they're, you know, so when, when push came to shove, Peter just did not have the strength to carry through on the commitment that he had made to the Lord. And the Bible says that when he denied him that third time, the rooster crowed. And when the rooster crowed, it reminded him, that's what Jesus said was going to happen. And I have done exactly the thing that I said I was, wasn't going to do. How many of you have ever done the exact thing that you said, I will never do that. I will never, I'm not going to mess up in that area ever again, right? Yeah, you said that. And, and then you failed. And, boy, it's hard to get up whenever you feel that condemnation of failure, of not keeping your commitment. And so I believe that the reason why the angel had to call out Peter and say, tell his disciples and Peter is because Peter was at such a low point of failure <clears throat> that he did not even consider himself worthy to be a part of the of the whole group. Now this is the same one that Jesus had said, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and uh, you're going to um, you're going to lead my church upon this rock I'll build my church the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and unto you I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And so God had a destiny for Peter but because of failure Peter was at a place that he wasn't even going to try anymore. And I believe that it was just necessary to put that extra little ump to say, I know that you don't even feel like you're worthy to be the least of my disciples, but I haven't changed my mind about you. And I want to tell you today that God hasn't changed his mind about any of us. Amen. He who called us is faithful, and he has committed himself uh, to our success. What did uh, Jesus say to Peter at one point? He said, he said, Satan has desire to sift you as wheat. Just, to, just for your very essence to just pass through his fingers and he'll just have total control. 
He said, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. He never said, I've prayed for you that you won't fail. He said, I've prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail you, that you don't stop believing in your purpose and believing in me and believing in yourself. But sometimes we find ourselves in a place where it's hard not to believe in God maybe, but to believe in ourselves again and believe that God could uh, could still use us. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard somebody say, I've gone too far, or God could, could never love me after all that I've done. You ever heard people say that? It's the com most common thing that people will say is that, how could God love me? How could God give me another chance uh, after the things that I have done? You know, the funny thing about forgiveness, uh, it's so easy to apply it uh, in the general broad context of humanity. Oh, God forgives everyone until we have that one person that has hurt us the worst and we find ourselves struggling to forgive, you know. Or when we have failed in some, uh, whether in our mind or whether in reality, some major way we have failed God. And uh, I was thinking on this the other day, how that Jesus just said so easily to his disciples, if your brother sins against you, whenever you um, approach the subject of forgiveness, the question was asking, actually asking how many times should I forgive for the same person that keeps doing me wrong? He said, until seven times. He actually suggested, you know, a reasonable number. How about seven times? I'm sure he based it on something concrete like the principle of completion, the importance of the number seven in the Word of God, um, how it represents completion and coming full circle. And so in his mind, when he asked the question, I'm sure the disciple thought, yeah, you know, seven times, that sounds reasonable to me. And Jesus said, well, I say unto you, not seven times, but until 70 times seven. That's 490 times. And, and we've talked about how that, you know, he's referring to um, that's just in one day. A person continually offends. You have to have a posture of forgiveness. But think about this. If God requires that of us, how how much more does he require that of himself? He's not going to tell you to be ready to forgive, but then when you fail, he's going to withhold and want you to suffer and learn your lesson, right? And and make you apologize and and uh, well and, and cry. And we will do all that when we sin and when we fail. We, we go through that because our heart is condemned and we're convicted. But I want to tell you that the moment that you change your mind and you purpose to get up, the Bible says that the righteous man falls seven times and he gets up again. So that's the main difference. The wicked fall and wallow in that and don't try anymore. But he said the righteous, he just keeps getting back up again. And God makes it easy for us to get up and to try again. Amen. Why do you think the Lord chose Peter to preach the first gospel message at Pentecost? Why do you think he chose him in the very beginning to be the one to preach that message? Anybody? I mean, obviously Peter didn't have any, he did have a revelation that the, other, the others were slower to get. But I do believe they got the revelation eventually too. So why did the Lord choose him? And two verses later, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Because Peter said, you ain't going to the cross. This isn't, this, isn't the, this isn't the will of God for anybody to have to go. I just, no, I'm not going to let this happen. Okay, we're not going to let this happen. He, he refused to accept what Christ's true mission was. This is right after he said, um, told him upon this rock I built my church. You have the revelation of the mighty God Christ and and then two verses later he says get thee behind me Satan you don't even savor you don't savor the things of God 
you're not interested in the will of God. Well, what a flip, huh? So why did he choose Peter out of all that? Why did he choose the sons of thunder? You know, the the two the two guys that was ready to call down fire from heaven on uh, people that was coming against their group. Why didn't he choose John? I mean, John probably would have been my pick, right? John, the one who was so close to Jesus. Why did he pick Peter? Well, I'll tell you why, since you're not going to tell me. I'll tell you why I think. I think that God chooses people who understand failure to minister to people who are trying to get up from failure. And the first gospel message was this. Now, we all apply it to, our, to ourselves that we are guilty of the blood of Jesus. But these people, I mean, our sin put him on the cross, right? He, if it had been nobody else, he would have died for you if you were the only person. We preach that. But the truth of the matter is, when Peter preached the first gospel message, he was preaching to some people who literally were the ones that delivered Jesus up to the council. He was preaching to some in that crowd that took part in the beating and in uh, the crucifixion process. They were people that was in the crowd that was shouting, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, but crucify, give us the murderer to go free, but crucify this man. And he had to preach to them, you're guilty of the blood of Jesus. You are the you are guilty, and they had to be able to say, what must we do when they were pricked in their hearts and convicted? It's one thing for someone who's high and mighty to tell you what you need to do. It's another thing for a person who had denied Jesus himself that could identify with what they were feeling and and not uh, lord over them uh, that they're somehow better than them. We, we're never going to win anybody if that's our if that's our attitude. If we think we've got it all together and and uh, maybe the Lord will have mercy on them, we're never going to save anyone like that. We've got to identify with where they're at. And if you'll remember the pit that you were dug from, there's not a person in this room that cannot identify with failure and the feelings that people are experiencing right now. Even maybe people in this room that are trying to decide, should I go on? Should I even continue to live for God. Every time I get serious about this, it seems like I fail more miserably than the last. But remember that God had a destiny for Simon Peter. He has a destiny for you. And it could be that he chose you not because you were so great, but he chose you because you were not so great. A one preacher that I really respect, he, he said, when we're dealing with people, we need to remember this. People are pitiful, and we are people. We are people. So how does that give you hope for your own life? When you see the story of what happened with Peter and how he uh, failed the Lord and he did not live up to his potential, how does that give you hope for your life? And it's one thing to just read that in a scripture. It's another thing to see that that scripture lived out in somebody's life. And uh, for me personally, um, I have probably affected more lives with the testimony of, of overcoming a failure than I ever could have had that person viewed me as being perfect or not been aware of um, that I have had my own issues, my own problems in life that I had to overcome. Those are the things that connect us uh, to others. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Uh, let me read that to you. i got to hurry. I've got five minutes here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Now, you know, we can have faith 
that God will extend grace to us to walk in newness of life. We can have faith because we've seen that example throughout the Word of God in other people's lives just like we have talked about Simon Peter. God is love. He doesn't just love, but he is love. That's his essence. His love and his grace is inseparable from his very nature. There's not a one of us that can save ourselves, and we can't make any spiritual progress without God at work in our lives. We need Jesus in order to overcome. And thankfully, God lovingly gives us grace. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, everybody say, but God. But God, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. And then he puts in parentheses, by grace ye are saved. What did grace do? Grace quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath, he hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So verse 8 tells us that we are saved by what? Grace. We are saved by grace. Uh, verses 8 and 9 tell us, tell us that there is uh, nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. Now I know we can we can go off the rails when we start talking about earning our salvation or not earning our salvation. There's a ditch on both sides of the road. And on one side of the road are people that say everything is a work. Baptism is a work. Receiving the Holy Ghost is a work. And, and you're saved by grace. You're not saved by works. And so they classify every spiritual response as a work. As if you are earning your salvation simply by doing what God told you to do. Okay, so... On the other side of the road is the ditch that says, you know, I gotta, I gotta keep working and working and working, and if I will do everything exactly right, and if I can get to a place where I don't fail anymore, then maybe I'll be worthy that God will give me His salvation. No, God already gave you His salvation, but here's what He did: when He gave you grace, He didn't give you a get out of jail free card. He didn't give you an excuse to continue to live in sin, okay, what he gave you was power to overcome sin. We were quickened together with Christ. Just as he was raised from the dead, we have been raised to walk in the newness of life, and that is the Spirit of God, the power of God living within us, the power to get up when, when nobody else uh, would ever believe that you could get up. Nobody believed that Jesus was going to come out of that grave because that had never been done before. But he rose victorious over death and hell, and he said, if that same spirit be in you that, that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies. All right? So that is the key, is that when grace came, it was not just... And when we ask people to define grace, they're going to define it a lot of ways. The unmerited favor of God. That's true. We didn't deserve it. But it is more than just favor when we don't deserve favor. It is also empowerment. Okay? It is the power to do what we could not do before. It's the power to succeed. It's the power to get up again when I do fail. It's the power to live out the things that in the Old Testament... They tried to do in the flesh according to the law, but they but their flesh could not accomplish that on on its own. But Jeremiah prophesied and said, under the new covenant, that was the old covenant. Here's the rule, and you follow the rule. Okay? But in the new covenant, Jeremiah said, I'm going to uh, 
uh, take that law that was written on tablets of stone, which, by the way, was broken both literally and um, and physically. By the time Moses came down the mountain with those laws, they had already broken them all, right? They was breaking them right then. That's when I had no other gods before me. They was already breaking the law before, when it was hot off the press because that's what the flesh is going to do. And when Moses saw it, he threw down the tablets and physically broke them, and God had to write them out for him again. And so our flesh is predisposed to failure, but our flesh is not predisposed to get up from failure. Okay? But grace gives us the power to get back up. And it gives us the power to um, resist uh, the wiles of the enemy as well if we will walk in that empowerment that has been given. So Jeremiah said God's going to write those laws that were on tablets of stone. He's going to write them in our hearts. Okay? So now it's not just something on the outside of my being, but now it's on the inside guiding my life. It's 8.02, so we've got to stop. Let's stand together. 2 Peter 3 and 9. Oh, we got three scriptures here. 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is God's default when dealing with this disobedience in humanity, and that is to be patient, to supernaturally draw us to himself, and to be quick to forgive. Uh, read for me Romans 15 and 5, very quickly. Romans 15 and 5. Okay, so he is patient, and he's a God of consolation. John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Okay, so God is patient, and he supernaturally draws us to himself. And then 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, he is faithful and just. God is predisposed toward forgiveness. So whatever failures that you've experienced, get up and try again. God's grace is with you, and we are saved because of that empowerment of his spirit. Grace empowers us. Remember this. Grace empowers us to respond to the gospel. And if grace empowers us to respond to the gospel, then it also empowers us to live a full and triumphant life in that relationship with Jesus. Are we going to fall down yes. in the process along the way? Yes, we are. But we don't then just say, well, because of grace, it doesn't matter how I live. We are not responsible for our salvation. This is how I want to say it. We're not responsible for our salvation, but we are responsible to our salvation. Okay? We can't earn it, but we, we still have to contribute our effort uh, in order to be successful in our walk with God. This contradicts our North American tendency toward independence and individualism because the gospel demands us to surrender to God. And we can't surrender and continue to brag about being a self-made man or woman and claim to not need anyone else. We need each other. But sometimes we take that same mindset into our walk with God um, of independence and individualism, it doesn't work. We have to lay ourselves at the foot of the cross, surrender ourselves fully to God, and let his grace uh, do its work in our lives. Would you pray with me tonight? Lord, we thank you for your grace, and we put our faith in your grace, your empowerment, your spirit that you place within us, God. We thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our lives right now in spite of our missteps, in spite of our miscues, in spite of our failures, Lord. And there are things that, uh, where we've made mistakes, Lord, that you've used those things to make a testimony in our lives. And we give you the praise for it. We give you the glory for it, God. You're the only one that can take the ashes of our life and turn them into something joyful. We give you the praise and the glory. We pray, God, you would just have your way through us. Help us, God, to demonstrate to others what the redeemed life looks like. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.